pleasure to announce and introduce Dr. Michael Greger. <laughs> Having him here is a huge accomplishment for Atlanta. We are so honored and so proud that he is spending his time with us. He does so much good work. He is so well known. His videos and his writing gives me comfort and confidence when I start to feel like I don't have a lot of confidence and I'm not that comfortable. So I know that there are so many here who feel the same way. A founding member and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Michael Greger, MD, is a physician, New York Times best-selling author, and internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues. He has lectured at the Conference on World Affairs, testified before Congress, and was invited as an expert witness in the defense of Oprah Winfrey in the infamous Meat Defamation Trial. He is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. Currently, Dr. Greger serves as the Director of Public Health and Animal Agriculture at the Humane Society of the United States. His latest book, How Not to Die, became an instant New York Times bestseller. More than a thousand of his nutrition videos are freely available at nutritionfacts.org with yeah. new videos and articles posted every day. Everyone, Atlanta, make some noise for Dr. Michael Gray. <laughs> chest pain. Her life was over at age 65. But then she heard about this guy, Nathan Pritikin, one of our early lifestyle medicine pioneers. And what happened next is actually detailed in Pritikin's biography. My grandma was one of the death door people, like Francis Greger. My grandmother arrived in a wheelchair. Mrs. Greger had heart disease, angina, claudication. Her condition so bad, she can only walk without great pain in her chest and legs. Within three weeks, though, she's not only out of a wheelchair, she was walking 10 miles a day. Here's a picture of my grandma at her grandson's wedding. 15 years after the doctors had abandoned her to die. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65. Thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet until age 96. Enjoy her six grandkids, including me. That's why I went into medicine. Um, is there anything we do about the screen? Just uh, dim the lights a little bit, just uh, so as to not. Uh, um, and I look a little jaundiced here. <laughs> wow. All right. Do not use IV IV drugs and uh, IV drugs. And, all right. That's fine. When Dr. Dean Ornish published his landmark lifestyle health trial years later, which proved, with something called quantitative angiography, that indeed heart disease could be reversed, arteries opened up without drugs, without surgery, and the majority of patients 
um, just with a plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, I assume this is going to be the game changer. I mean, my family had seen it with their own eyes, but here it was, in black and white, published in some of the most prestigious medical journals in the world, yet nothing happened. So wait a second, but effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignore it. What else might there be in the medical literature that could help my patients, which is to have a, a corporate budget driving its promotion? Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. For those of you unfamiliar with my work, every year I read through every issue of every English language nutrition journal on the planet. So busy folks like you don't have to. Very nice. <laughs> I think compiled the most interesting, most groundbreaking, the most practical findings and new videos now to upload every day to my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. <laughs> Sponsorship, strictly not a commercial, not selling anything, just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandma. New videos and articles every day on the latest in evidence based nutrition. What a concept. Okay, well, so where did Pritikin get his evidence from? Well, a network of missionary hospitals set up throughout Sub Saharan Africa uncovered what may be one of the most important advances in health. The fact that many of our major and commonest diseases were universally rare, like heart disease. In the African population of Uganda, for example, coronary heart disease almost non existent. You say, wait a second, our number one killer, almost non existent, what were they eating? Well, they were eating lots of vegetables and grains and greens and their protein almost exclusively from plant sources. And they had the cholesterol levels to prove it, very similar to what one sees in modern day plant eaters. So wait a second, maybe, maybe they were just dying early from something else, never lived long enough to get heart disease. No, here's age match heart attack rates in Uganda versus St. Louis. Now 632 autopsies in Uganda, only one myocardial infarction out of 632 age and gender matched um, uh, autopsies in Missouri, 136 myocardial infarctions, more than 100 times the rate of our leading kill. In fact, they were so blown away, they went back, did another 800 autopsies in Uganda, still just that one small healed infarct, meaning it wasn't even the cause of death. I have 1,427 patients, less than one in a thousand, whereas here, heart disease is an epidemic. Here's a list of diseases commonly found here, in places that eat and live like the U.S., but were rare or even non-existent among populations that centered their diets around whole plant foods. These are among our most common diseases, like obesity, for example, hiatal hernia, the most common stomach problem, varicose veins and, varicose veins and hemorrhoids, two of the most common venous problems, colorectal cancer, leading cancer killer, um, uh, diverticulosis, the most common disease of the attend intestines, appendicitis, number one cause of emergency abdominal surgery, gallbladder disease, number one cause of non-emergency abdominal surgery, as well as ischemic heart disease, our commonest cause of death here, but a rarity among plant-based populations, which suggests that heart disease may be a choice. Like Cavities. You know, if you look at the teeth of people who lived 10,000 years before the invention of the toothbrush, pretty much no cavities. Didn't brush a day in their life. No flossing. Yet, no cavities. Why? Because candy bars haven't been invented yet. Okay, so why do we. Why do people continue to get cavities when we know they're preventable through diet? Well, simple. Because the pleasure people derive from dessert may outweigh the cost and discomfort of the dentist chair. And look, uh, that's fine, right? If you're an adult, maybe you the benefits outweigh the risk for you and your family, then go for it. I certainly enjoy the occasional indulgence. I got a good dental plan. <laughs> but what if instead of the plaque on our teeth, we're talking about the plaque building up inside of our arteries. Another disease that can be prevented 
by changes in our diet. Okay, now what are the consequences for you and your family? Okay, now we're not talking about scraping tartar anymore. Right? Now we're talking life and death. It's still up to each of us to make our own decisions as to what to eat and how to live, but we should make these choices consciously. We're educating ourselves about the predictable consequences of our actions. Atherosclerosis, hardening the arteries, is a disease that begins in childhood. By age 10, nearly all kids raised on the standard American diet already have what are called fatty streaks, the first stage of the disease. These then turn into plaques in our 20s, get worse in our 30s, and then they start killing us all. Our heart is called a heart attack, and our brain, the same disease, is called a stroke. So, if there's anyone here today, older than age 10, <laughs> then the question is not whether or not to eat healthy to prevent heart disease. It's whether you want to reverse the heart disease you already have. But is that even possible? You know, when researchers took people with heart disease, put them on the kind of diet, plant-based diet, followed by populations that did not get heart disease, their hope was that, hey, maybe we can slow the disease down, perhaps even stop it. Instead, something miraculous happened. As soon as people stopped eating artery-clogging diets, their bodies were able to start dissolving some of that plaque away, opening up arteries without drugs, without surgery, suggesting their bodies wanted to be healthy all along, but were just never given the chance. See this incredible improvement in blood flow actually to the heart and muscle. You said there's a cross-section of the heart. Um, this was after just three weeks eating healthy. Let me share with you what's been called the best kept secret in all of medicine. You know, the best kept secret in medicine is that sometimes, under the right conditions, the body can actually heal itself. You know, if you, uh, you know, whack your shin really hard on a coffee table, it can get a red hot, painful, swollen, inflamed, but will heal naturally if you just stand back and let your body work its magic. All right, but what if you kept whacking your shin in the same place day after day? In fact, three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> you never heal. You go to your doctor and be like, oh, my shin hurts. They'd be like, no problem. I trained for this. Whip out their pad, write your prescription for painkillers. You're still whacking your shin three times a day. Oh, it still really hurts like heck, but oh, it feels so much better with those pain pills on board. Thank heaven for modern medicine. <laughs> it's like uh, when people take nitroglycerin for crushing chest pain. Tremendous relief, but you're not doing anything to treat the underlying cause of the disease. Our body wants to come back to health if we let it, but if we keep re-damaging ourselves three times a day, we may never heal. It's like smoking. One of the most amazing things I learned in all my medical training was that within about 15 years of stopping smoking, your lung cancer risk approaches that of a lifelong non-smoker. Isn't that amazing? Your lungs can clear out all that tar, and eventually it's almost as if you never started smoking at all. And every morning of our smoking life, that healing process started to win. First cigarette of the day. Re-injuring our lungs with every puff, just like we can re-injure our arteries with every bite, when all we had to do all along, the miracle cure is just stand back, get out of the way, right? Stop re-injuring ourselves and let our body's natural healing processes bring us back towards health. The human body is a self-healing machine. Sure, you can choose moderation, Hit yourself with a smaller hammer. <laughs> but why beat yourself up at all? This is nothing new. Uh, American Heart Journal 1977, cases like Mr. F.W. here, heart disease so bad couldn't even make it to the mailbox. Started eating healthier. A few months later, he was climbing mountains, no pain. <laughs> 
Now, there are these fancy new classes of anti-angina drugs on the market now. Uh, cost thousands of dollars a year, but at the highest dose may be able to extend exercise duration as long as 33 and a half seconds. <laughs> It does not look like those choosing the drug route are going to be climbing mountains anytime soon. <laughs> See, plant-based diets aren't just safer and cheaper. They can work better because you're treating the actual cause of the disease. Heart disease is killer number one in this country. Killer number two in this country is cancer. What happens if you put cancer on a plant-based diet? Well, Dr. Dean Arnis and colleagues were able to reverse the progression of early stage prostate cancer with that same kind of plant-based diet and other healthy lifestyle behaviors, and no wonder. If you take the blood of people eating the standard American diet, drip that blood on the cancer cells growing in a petri dish, you can slow cancer growth down by a few percent. But you put people on a plant-based diet for a year, though, and their blood can do this. The blood circulating throughout the bodies of those eating plant-based has nearly eight times the stopping power when it comes to suppressing cancer cell growth. Now this was from men, prostate cancer. They wanted to repeat this study using women and breast cancer, number one cancer killer specific to women. But look, they didn't want to wait a whole year to get the results. Women are dying now. So they said, let's see what a plant-based diet can do after just two weeks against three different lines of human breast cancer. Uh, this is the before, cancer cell growth powering away at 100%, and then this is after eating healthy for just two weeks. This is, uh, this is a photo micrograph. Oh, I wish you could see this a little better. There's no way we can cut out this. See, it's kind of lit down here. Um, we're washing out the screen a little bit. Um, so what, this is a photo micrograph, photograph taken under market. So what they did is they laid down a confluent layer of cancer, a carpet of breast cancer, and then they dripped the blood of women eating the standard American diet onto that cancer. And if you can see this, if you've been eating your carrots and are sitting away up here, um, you can see it kind of breaks the um, cancer up in these kind of cancer continents. Instead of a, a confluent layer, a carpet, it kind of breaks it up. So there's a big patch of cancer here. Um, then you take these women, put them on a plant-based diet, and you retest two weeks later. Right, so they act as their own control. Same women, two weeks later after eating healthy, they lay down another layer of breast cancer, drip their blood two weeks later, and all you're left with is this. Just a few individual cancer cells left. Before and after. Just two weeks eating healthy. Their bloodstream became that much more hostile to cancer. Now, suppressing cancer cell growth is nice. Getting rid of it is even better than what's called apoptosis, programmed cell death. Their bodies are able to reprogram the cancer cells, forcing them into early retirement. This is what's called tunnel imaging, measuring DNA fragmentation or cell death, where dying cancer cells show up as little white spots. So, for example, here up in the corner. Um, and so, even if you're a woman eating a pretty poor diet, you're not totally defenseless, you can kill off a few cancer cells, then you take these same women, put them on a plant-based diet, retest two weeks later, and their blood can do that. It's like you're an all, uh, entirely different person in some. The same blood, now circulating throughout these women's bodies, gained the power to significantly slow down and stop breast cancer cell growth after just two weeks eating healthy. What kind of blood do we want in our body? Uh, what kind of immune system? Uh, do we want bl blood that just kind of rolls over when new cancer cells pop up? Or do we want blood circulating to every nook and cranny in our body with the power to slow down and stop? Now this dramatic strengthening in cancer defenses was after two weeks of a plant-based diet and exercise. They had these women out walking 30 to 60 minutes a day. They said, well, wait a second, we do two things. How do you know what, what role the diet played? So researchers decided to put it to the test. This is what we saw before, this measuring cancer cell clearance um, uh, of a healthy plant-based diet and exercise. In this case, on average, for 14 years, jaundiced as well, 14 years, <laughs> That plant-based diet, great for everything, but for the liver, oh, no. Um, uh, 
But look at all the beta carotene in that apple, I tell you. Um, uh, so, cancer st um, uh, um, uh, stopping power. Um, compare that to the cancer stopping power of your average uh, sedentary American, see the little cheeseburger there, um, which is essentially non existent. Okay, but here's the interesting group in the middle. What about 14 years standard American diet, but 14 years of daily, strenuous, hour long exercise like calisthenics? <laughs> They wanted to know if you exercise long enough, if you exercise hard enough, can you rival some strolling plant eaters over here? And the answer is exercise help. No question. But literally 5,000 hours in the gym, no match for a plant-based diet. This is that same tunnel image that we saw before. Even if you're a couch potato living off of fried potatoes, you're not totally defenseless. You can knock off a few cancer cells. You exercise for 5,000 hours, you can kill off cancer cells left and right, but nothing appears to kick more cancer tush than a plant-based diet. And that is because animal protein, meat, egg, white, and dairy protein, increases the level of something called IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1, which is a cancer-promoting growth hormone involved in the acquisition and progression of malignant tumors. But if we decrease our intake of animal protein, we decrease our intake of IGF-1. So this may explain, uh, so, uh, so here, for example, within two weeks of, uh, of uh, eating plant-based, um, IGF-1 levels drop, and they continue to drop the longer you eat healthy. And the levels of IGF-1 binding protein go up. IGF-1 binding protein, one of our body's ways to protect itself from cancer, protect itself from excessive growth, sure, as few as two weeks, you can drop your levels, your um, body's production of IGF-1. But wait a second, what about all the IGF-1 you have circulating in your system from the bacon and eggs you had three weeks ago? Well, your liver releases this snatch squad of binding proteins to tie up any excess IGF-1, pull it out of the system, protective levels go up within weeks, benefits continue to accrue the longer we eat healthy. Here's the experiment that really nailed IGF-1 as the villain. Um, same thing we saw before, healthy diet and exercise, cancer cell growth drops, cancer cell death shoots up. But here's the interesting column here. What if you add back to the cancer just the amount of IGF-1 you banish from your system because you started eating healthy? What happens? You effectively erase the diet and exercise effect. Um, so this is how we know um, that um, uh, eating, cutting down our intake of animal protein reduces our levels of IGF-1, which reduces cancer growth. How much less cancer growth are we talking about? Um, but this would certainly explain, um, for example, why the incidence of all cancers combined was lower among those even more plant-based um, uh, compared to the general population. How low can we go? Well, um, thousands of people were followed for um, uh, years, thousands of uh, those in middle age found that those who ate the most protein had 75% increased risk of dying prematurely and fourfold increased risk of dying specifically from cancer, but not all proteins, specifically that animal protein, which makes sense given the IGF-1 story we just talked about. The <laughs> academic institution where this study was done sent out a press release with a memorable opening line. That chicken wing you're eating could be as deadly as a cigarette. <laughs> Explaining that, look, quadrupling one's risk of dying from cancer, that's comparable to what one might get smoking cigarettes. So what was the reaction in the scientific community to this revelation that diets high meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to the health of smoking? Well, one nutrition scientist said it was potentially dangerous to tell people about this study. Why? Because a smoker might think, hey, why bother quitting smoking if my ham and cheese sandwich is just as bad for me? Right? So let's not tell anyone about this whole meat and cheese. Shh. That uh, reminds me of this famous Philip Morris cigarette ad that tried to downplay the risk by saying, hey, you think secondhand smoke is bad, increasing the risk of lung cancer 19%. Well, hey, drinking one or two glasses of milk every day, maybe three times as bad, 62% increased risk of lung cancer. Or doubling your risk frequently cooking with oil, or multiplying your risk, or tripling your risk by eating non-vegetarian. We're multiplying risk sixfold to eat lots of meat and dairy. So they conclude. <laughs> <laughs>
Oh, let's keep some perspective here. <laughs> the risks from cigarettes, you know, well, maybe well below that of other everyday activities. So breathe deep. <laughs> right? It's like saying, yeah, don't worry about getting stabbed, because getting shot so much worse. <laughs> uh, how about night? Two risks don't make a right. <laughs> of course, you'll know Philip Moore stopped throwing dairy under the bus once they purchased Kraft Foods. Just saying. <laughs> All right, we talked about killer number one, heart disease, killer number two, cancer. You know, every year the CDC comes out, oh, in fact, the CDC right here in the land of Georgia, um, uh, compiles the top 15 causes of death in the United States. Um, we talked about killers number one and two. Uh, I thought I'd talk about the role dime I play in preventing, arresting, and reversing each of our 15 killers. Just 13 causes of death to go. <clears throat> the top three killers used to be heart disease, cancer, stroke. Oh, that's so 2007. Now it's heart disease, cancer, and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases like emphysema. Thankfully, Plant-based diet can be used to help prevent COPD, even be used to treat COPD, significantly improving lung function over time. But the, uh, the tobacco industry had a very different take on this study. I mean, if adding plants to our diet can improve lung function, wouldn't it be easier to just add plants to cigarettes? And indeed, <laughs> the addition of acai berries to cigarettes evidently has a protective effect against emphysema in smoking mice. <laughs> Who would have thunk it, right? Next, they're going to start adding berries to meat. And indeed, I couldn't make this stuff up, ladies and gentlemen. The addition of fruit extracts to burger patties was not without its glitches. For example, the blackberries dyed the burger patties. The stink purplish color kind of turned people off a little bit. Though evidently you can improve the tenderness of lamb carcasses if you infuse them before rigor mortis sets in with kiwi fruit chips. You can even improve the nutritional profile of frankfurters by adding uh, powdered grape seeds. Um, though there were complaints that uh, the grape seed particles became visible in the final product. And look, there's one thing we know about hot dog eaters is that they're picky about what goes in their food. <laughs> But grape seeds, Ew! <laughs> All right, killer number four is stroke. Um, uh, preventing strokes, maybe all about eating potassium-rich foods. Um, again, most Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum daily intake of potassium. By most, I'm talking more than 98%. More than 98% of Americans don't reach the recommended minimum daily intake because more than 98% of Americans don't eat enough plants. Potassium comes from the words pot ash, take any plant, put it in a pot, reduce the ash, you're left with pot ash, you have potassium, so-called vegetable alkali, but who can name me one plant food in particular? I have potassium? Yeah. Well, of course, bananas. You know, it's funny, I you know, speak all across the world, and you know, it's like the one thing everybody seems to know about nutrition. Like, I don't know, Chiquita had like a, good PR firm or something, but that's, turns out, bananas don't even make the top 50 sources, coming in at number 86, uh, right behind fast food vanilla milkshakes, he goes fast food vanilla and then bananas. It's funny, when I was uh, writing the new book, I went back to check, and actually USDA has expanded their nutrient database. Now, currently, bananas don't even make the top thousand sources. Coming in at number 1,161, right after Reese's Pieces. I kid you not. <laughs> the most concentrated sources of potassium in our diet is number one, greens. Go get those collards at Solvest. Number one, greens. Number two, beans. And number three, dates. Again, bananas don't even make the top thousand. In fact, if you look at our next leading cause of death, bananas <laughs> could be downright dangerous. <laughs> Alzheimer's.
Alzheimer's disease is next. You know, uh, 20 years ago, it wasn't even in the top 10. Four million Americans affected. According to the latest dietary guidelines for the prevention of this horrific disease, the two most important things we can do, number one, cut down our intake of meat, dairy, and junk, and increase our intake of vegetables, legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, fruits, and whole grains. Um, and this is based in part on data going back decades now uh, that found that those who uh, eat meat, red meat, white meat, didn't matter, uh, between about two to three times the risk of becoming demented later in life, and the longer people ate healthy, the lower their risk dropped. Killer number seven, type two diabetes, a disease we've known we can prevent, arrest, and reverse with a plant-based diet since the 1930s. Put people on a version of a plant-based diet. Um, within uh, five years, a quarter, about a quarter of the diabetics were able to get off insulin altogether. But you know, plant-based diets tend to be relatively low-calorie diets. I mean, so. Maybe their diabetes just got better because they lost so much weight. I mean, to tease that out, what you'd have to do, put people on a healthy diet, but force them to eat so much food that they don't lose any weight. Then we could see if there's specific, particular benefits to plant-based eating beyond just all the easy weight loss. All right, well, we'd have to wait a few decades, but here it is. Subjects are weighed every day. They started to lose weight. They were made to eat more food. In fact, so much more food, some of the participants have problems eating it all, they're like, oh, not another salad, oh. But eventually they adapted, so um, no weight loss despite reduced, um, uh, restricted meat, eggs, dairy, and junk. Okay, so with zero weight loss, did a plant-based diet still help their diabetes? Well, insulin needs were cut 60%, and half the diabetics were able to get off all their insulin altogether. Wow, how many years did that take? No, 16 days, 16 days later. So we're talking diabetics who've had diabetes as long as 20 years, injecting 20 units of insulin a day, then 13 days later on none. Diabetes for 20 years, then off all insulin in less than two weeks. Diabetes for 20 years because no one had told them about a plant-based diet. For decades, they were 13 days away. Here's participant number 15. 32 units of insulin on the control diet, and then 18 days later on none. Lower blood sugars on 32 units, less insulin. That's the power of plants. And look, this is with zero weight loss, right? His body just started working that much better. And what are the side effects? How about cholesterol is dropping like a rock to uh, under 150? Uh, again, only about two weeks. So, you know, just like asking people to make moderate changes in diet, we're only getting moderate benefits in terms of cholesterol reduction. How moderate do you want your diabetes? <laughs> asking diabetics to make moderate changes. I mean, you know, everything in moderation is a truer statement than many people realize. Asking diabetics to make moderate changes in diet can leave them with moderate blindness, moderate kidney failure, moderate amputation, maybe just a few toes or something. <laughs> Moderation in all things is not necessarily a good thing. Remember that study that purported to show that diets high meat, eggs, and dairy could be harmful to the health of smoking? Well, supposedly suggested that those who eat lots of meat, eggs, and dairy, four times the likelihood of dying from cancer or diabetes. But you know, if you look at the actual study, you'll see that's simply not true. Those eating lots of animal protein during middle age didn't have four times the likelihood of dying from diabetes. They had 73 times the likelihood of dying from diabetes. Now, those that chose moderation, only eating a moderate amount of animal protein, oh, they just had 23 times the risk of death from diabetes. Killer number eight is kidney failure, chronic kidney disease, a disease we can both prevent and treat 
with a help of a plant-based diet, and no wonder. Kidneys are highly vascular organs, so no surprise that Harvard researchers found three dietary risk factors for declining kidney function. Number one, animal protein. Number two, animal fat. And number three, cholesterol. Animal fat can alter the actual structure of the human kidney based on autopsy studies like this, showing that plugs of fat literally clogging up the works and autopsy to human kidneys. And then, um, animal protein can have a profound effect on normal kidney function, inducing something called hyperfiltration, increasing the workload on the kidney, but not plant protein. All right, so you can do these experiments where you give people a single meal of tuna fish, right? Tuna fish. Um, and you see increased pressure with the kidneys build up one, two, three hours after the meal in both uh, non-diabetics and diabetics. Right? Okay, but what if you ate the exact same amount of protein, but instead of having a tuna fish salad sandwich, you had a tofu salad sandwich. What happens? Absolutely nothing. Your kidneys can handle plant protein without even batting an eyelash. So, wait, so why does the animal protein cause this overload reaction but not plant protein? That's because of the inflammation triggered within hours of eating animal products. How do we know that? Because if you give a powerful anti-inflammatory drug along with that tuna fish, you can abolish that hyperfiltration protein leakage response to meat ingestion. And then there's the acid load. The consumption of foods like meat, eggs, dairy induces the formation of acid within our kidneys Animal foods tend to be acid forming. Oh, and what this causes is some called tubular toxicity, damage to the delicate urine making tubes within the kidneys. So, if you compare all the foods, um, animal foods tend to be acid forming, particularly fish, which is actually the worst, and then pork, poultry on down the list, whereas plant foods tend to be either kind of neutral or actually base forming, alkaline. Um, particularly dark green leafy vegetables to counteract some of the acids formed from our diet. So the key to halting the progression of chronic kidney failure may lie in the produce aisle or the farmer's market rather than the farm of sea. Indeed, no surprise that plant-based diets have been used to treat kidney failure for decades now. Um, here's protein leakage on the standard uh, low sodium diet. This is typically what us physicians will put people on with um, declining kidney function. Then they switch them to the supplemented vegan diet, then back to conventional, plant-based. Conventional, plant-based. Switching on and off kidney dysfunction like a light switch, depending on what was going into their mouth. Killer number nine, respiratory infection. Say, okay, what possible role could diet play in you know, a respiratory infection like pneumonia? Well, obviously, Hillary didn't see my video, Kale and the Immune System, talking about the anti, talking about the immunostimulatory effects of kale. Is there anything kale cannot do? <laughs> Boosting antibody production sevenfold, but this is in a petri dish. What about people? If you take older men and women, they're 50s, 60s, and 70s, split them into two groups, right before getting their Pneumovax vaccination, their pneumonia vaccination, half to eat their regular diet, the other half you just add a few servings of uh, fruits and vegetables to their daily diet, you get a significant boost in protective antibody responses, just adding a few extra servings. So it's not cutting out meat, just adding. Few servings of produce can significantly boost one's immune function. Killer number 10 is suicide. Now, we know for years that people that eat healthier also tend to feel healthier. In fact, only about half of the levels of depression, anxiety, and stress scores uh, compared to those that eat more typical American diets. And we think it's because of arachidonic acid. This inflammatory long chain omega-6 fatty acid found in animal products, um, particularly actually in uh, chicken and eggs. Uh, so yes, also beef, sausage, etc. But um, overwhelmingly, uh, chicken and eggs. 
And so if you take people and you remove eggs, remove chicken, remove other meat, you get a significant improvement in mood within just two weeks. They can take, you know, drugs, you know, months to take an effect. So you can improve within just two weeks. So wait a second, am I just cherry picking here? What about all the other diets that have been proven to improve mood? There aren't any. There's a recent review um, concluding that only um, that, oh, uh, uh, j but just to explain again, uh, we think it's because of arachidonic acid adversely impacting mental health via a cascade of neuroinflammation, brain inflammation, but we can clear that inflammation from our brain as, in as few as two weeks by cutting down our intake of uh, eggs, chicken, and other meat. Um, here's that review I was just starting to talk about uh, that looked at all studies done to date. Only the plant-based dietary intervention is the only one ever proven in a um, uh, controlled trial to improve mood under any um, time span. It's kind of hard to cherry pick when there's only one cherry. <laughs> Works in a workplace setting too. Um, oh, here's that, uh, only one. Um, works in workplace setting too, this is at Geico Insurance. Um, what they did is that they went in, added some healthy options to the workplace cafeteria, along with weekly educational sessions. Um, and um, uh, they reported not only a significant increase in physical functioning, general health, vitality, all the things we'd expect, but also in mental health. And this led to an improvement in worker productivity, which is, of course, what the company cares about. And so they took it nationwide. Um, ten corporate sites across Geico. Um, and uh, so half were control sites, but they didn't do anything. The other half, again, just had lentil soup, bean burritos, healthy food to the cafeteria. Um, and uh, in the workplaces that did, it got significant improvements in depression, anxiety, fatigue, emotional well-being, daily functioning, emotional health. So, you know, lifestyle interventions like exercise can improve both physical and mental health in terms of, uh, in terms of diet. Plant-based diets have the most evidence to support them. Killer number 11 is systemic blood infections. Uh, sure, there's some foodborne bacteria that can burrow through the intestinal wall get into your bloodstream, or in women, crawl up into their bladder. We've done for decades now. That's actually bacteria crawling up from the rectum that cause bladder infections in women, but we didn't know where this reservoir of bladder infecting E. coli was coming from until now. Chicken. That's where it originally comes from before it colonizes the woman's digestive tract and then crawls up and causes bladder infections. We now have um, DNA fingerprinting proof of a direct link um, between uh, farm animals, meat, and bladder infections in women. Solid evidence um, that uh, urinary tract infections can be what's called a zoonosis, an animal to human disease. Um, he said, wait a second, who undercooks chicken? Can't you just use a meat thermometer, cook the meat through? What's the big deal? The big deal is what's called cross-contamination. If you take 40 families, um, give them a frozen chicken to prepare and cook in their home as they normally would, multitudes of antibiotic-resistant bacteria jump from the chicken into the guts of the volunteers even before they eat it. So you can incinerate that chicken to ash. You don't even have to eat any of it. You're already infected before it makes it into the oven. Um, within days, the chicken bacteria multiplied to the point of becoming a major part of the person's gut floor. Chicken bacteria is like taking over. You say, okay, well fine, what if I use both safe handling and safe cooking guidelines? So they actually went in and instructed people <coughs> how to follow the official USDA recommendations where we're supposed to be doing is spra spraying a bleach solution all around common kitchen surfaces. Um, they instructed people how to do this. They did this and then came in later and swabbed around their kitchen and still found significant levels of Salmonella, Campylobacter, serious human pathogens um, on some utensils, disc cloth, counter, sink, rim, cupboard. The reason that families tend to have more bacteria from feces in their kitchen sink than on their toilet seat is because people tend to rinse chickens in the sink, not the toilet. <laughs> So, unless, unless our kitchen is like some biohazard lab, right, the only way we're going to guarantee not leaving infection around the kitchen is not bring it into our homes in the first place. So, wait a second, you can't sell unsafe, oh, and, um, but the good news is, 
Um, uh, the, you know, the, it's not like you eat chicken once, you're colonized for life. In this study, chicken bacteria only seemed to last for about 10 days before your good bacteria could kind of force it out of the way. The problem is that many families eat chicken more than once every 10 days, so maybe constantly reintroducing these chicken bugs into their system, which can then crawl up into their bladder later on and cause potentially serious um, urinary tract infections. So wait a second, you can't sell unsafe toys, you can't sell unsafe cars, how is it even legal to sell unsafe meat? Well, they do it by blaming the consumers. When USDA poultry microbiologist said, look, raw meats are not idiot proof. They can be mishandled in there, so they're handling a hand grenade, you pull the pin, someone's gonna get hurt. <laughs> now, while some may question the wisdom of selling hand grenades in supermarkets, uh, <laughs> Our poultry microbiologists disagree, saying, no, it's the consumer that's the most responsible. They just refuse to accept it. It's like a car company saying, yeah, we installed faulty brakes, but it's your fault for, you know, uh, uh, not putting your kids in a seatbelt or something, right? Or I guess, I guess we could say it's like Samsung saying, yeah, our phones explode, but it's your fault for putting it in your pocket, right? Um, uh, so, um, uh, the head of the CDC's Food Poisoning Division famously responded to this blame the victim attitude coming from the meat industry. Is it reasonable, she asked, is it reasonable that if a consumer undercooks a hamburger, their three-year-old dies? Is that reasonable? Not to worry, the meat industry's on it. They now have FDA approval for a bacteria eating virus to spray on the meat. Um, uh, no. Consumer, the industry is a little concerned about consumer acceptance of these so-called bacteria phages. may present somewhat of a challenge to the industry, so of course I'm not going to label it or anything. But if they think that's going to be a challenge, check out their other bright idea. The effect of extracted housefly bees, this is a sciencey way of saying they want to smear a maggot mixture on the meat. Now, it's a low cost, and so think about it. Look, maggots thrive off of rotting flesh. However, you know, um, there have been no, oh, sorry, there have been no reports. Where are we here? Um, there's been no reports, it says, of maggots having any serious diseases. So, hey, they must be filled with some kind of antibacteria something, right? Have you ever seen a maggot sneeze? I don't think so. So. <laughs> Let's take some maggots, grow them three days old, wash them off, tell them a little Vitamix action here, voila, safer meats. We talked about kidney failure, what about liver failure? We've known for decades that plant-based diet can be used to both prevent and treat liver failure. Um, significantly reducing the toxins that would otherwise build up eating meat without a fully functional liver to detoxify your blood. Though one does have to admit that there are some people consuming plant-based diets with worsening liver function. They're called alcoholics, living off of corn and potatoes and barley and sp strictly plant-based. They're not doing so good, it's not clear exactly. The <clears throat> Number 13 is high blood pressure, now affecting about 78 million Americans. That's about one in three American adults. And as we age, our pressures get higher and higher, such that by age 60, most of us are actually hypertensive. Most of us have high blood pressure. You say, well, wait a second. If most of us get high blood pressure when we age, look, maybe it's less a disease and more just a natural, inevitable consequence of aging. No, we've known since the 1920s that high blood pressure need not occur. They went into rural Kenya where they were eating, um, historically had been eating a diet uh, centered around uh, um, corn and beans and vegetables, fruit and greens. I measured uh, 1,000 people for, our blood, for blood pressure. Our pressures go up as we age. Their pressures go down. And the lower the better. We now have evidence even people with so-called normal blood pressure could benefit from blood pressure reduction. Now, if you went to your doctor with 120 over 80, you'd get a gold star, but now we know even people under 20, 120 over 80 may benefit from blood pressure reduction. So the ideal blood pressure, the no benefit from reducing it further blood pressure 
110 over 70. What? I mean, is it even possible to get pressures down to 110 over 70? It's not just possible, it's normal for those eating healthy enough diets. So, um, a couple years this Royal Canyon Hospital, 1,800 patients were admitted. How many cases of high blood pressure did they find? Mm, zero. Wow, they must have low rates of heart disease, right? Uh, no, they had no rates of heart disease. Now, a single case of atherosclerosis, our number one killer was found. Rural China, uh, same thing. Um, uh, about 110 over 70 their entire lives, 70-year-olds, same average blood pressure as 16-year-olds. Now, Africa, Asia, vastly different diets. What they share in common is that they're plant-based day-to-day with meat only eaten on special occasions. Why do we think it's the plant-based nature of their diet that was so protective? Because in the Western world, um, the only population of folks getting it down that low were those, according to the American Heart Association, were those eating strictly plant-based diets coming in at about 110 over 65. This is the largest study of plant-based eaters to date. It's the Adventist II study, mostly uh, done in California. Look at 89,000 people comparing non-vegetarians to so-called semi-vegetarians or flexitarians, people that meet only a few times a month, like once a week or so, um, compared to those that eat no meat at all except for fish, to compared to those who eat mo no meat, period, compared to those who eat no meat, eggs, or dairy. And what they saw is this kind of stepwise drop in high blood pressure rates, the more and more plant-based one's diet became. Same thing with type 2 diabetes, same thing with obesity. So yeah, sure, you can wipe out the vast majority of risk, throw it out the window by eating strictly plant-based, but it's not all or nothing. It's not black or white. Any movement we can make along the spectrum towards eating healthier can accrue significant health benefits. Now, experimentally, you can show this. For example, high blood pressure. You take vegetarians, you give them meat, pay them enough to eat it, and their blood pressures go up. Or you can take people who already eat meat, remove meat from the diet, their blood pressure go down within seven days. This is after the vast majority of them had to stop their blood pressure medications or reduce their blood pressure medications they had to. I mean, you can't treat the cause. You can't have normal blood pressure and be on blood pressure pills. You drop the pressure too low, it can be dangerous, get lightheaded, fall over, hurt yourself. So, lower pressures on fewer drugs. That's the power of plants. So, does the American Heart Association recommend a no-meat diet? Well, they recommend the so-called low-meat diet, the, the DASH diet. So wait a second, when the da this DASH diet was created, I mean, were they just not aware of this landmark research done by Harvard's uh, Frank Sachs? Uh, no, they were aware. The chair of the design committee that came up with the DASH diet was Frank Sachs. See, the DASH diet was created with the number one goal of capturing the blood pressure lowering benefits of a plant-based diet, yet contain enough animal products to make it palatable to the general population. They didn't think the public could handle the truth. <laughs> now you can see what they were thinking. Look, just like drugs never work unless you actually take them, Diets never work at all unless you actually eat them. So like, look, we can't tell anyone to eat strictly plant-based. We're not going to do that. So if we kind of soft pedal the message, come up with some kind of compromised diet, then on a population scale, maybe we'll do more good. Okay. <coughs> tell that to the thousand American families a day that lose a loved one to high blood pressure. Maybe it's time to start telling the American public the truth. Kill so number 14 is Parkinson's disease. Is a plant-based diet reduce one's risk of Parkinson's disease? Well, we know that most studies done today find this link between dairy consumption and Parkinson's. Why might that be? Well, there are neurotoxic chemicals present um, in the dairy supply, these neurotoxins. Um, so you have high levels of these organochlorine pesticides, for example, found not only in the milk supply, but in certain areas of the 
um, Parkinson's victims' brains on autopsy. They're talking about pollutants like tetrahydroisoquinoline, which is what scientists actually try to give in a lab to make primates have Parkinson's, found mostly in cheese, actually. Um, and so there's been calls in the dairy industry to pretty please test their products for toxins. Good luck with that. Of course, you could just not drink it, but then what would happen to your bones? <laughs> That's a marketing ploy. If you look at the actual science, you'll see that uh, milk consumption does not appear to reduce hip fracture risk. Whether you're drinking it as an adult, whether you're drinking it as a teen, doesn't matter, doesn't work. It may actually increase um, your risk of fracture, which may explain why countries that eat the most dairy actually have the highest um, hip fracture rates. So Swedish researchers decided to put it to the test. 100,000 men and women followed for years, um, and they found that milk-drinking women had higher rates of what? Higher rates of death. Significantly more heart attacks and strokes, significantly more cancer for each daily glass of milk. Those women, unfortunate enough to be drinking three glasses a day, had nearly twice the risk of dying prematurely, and they had more bone and head fractures too, more milk, more fractures, and milk-drinking men also had higher rates of death. Uh, but, you know, for some reason, you don't see milk ads uh, like this. I'm not sure exactly about <laughs> that. And finally, killer number 15, aspiration pneumonia caused by swallowing difficulties due to Parkinson's or a stroke or Alzheimer's, things we've already talked about. Okay, so here's the top 15 killers in the United States. And a plant-based diet can help prevent nearly all of them, can be used to treat more than half of them, and even may reverse the course of disease in some of them, including, in some cases, our top three killers. Now, Look, there are some drugs that can help. There's cholesterol-lowering drugs. Usually there's insulin injections, various sugar pills for diabetes. Usually it takes a couple different classes of high blood pressure pills to force people's blood pressure down. But the same diet does it all. It's not like there's a, some kind of heart-healthy diet that's somehow different from a brain-healthy diet. No, a kidney-healthy diet is a liver-healthy diet. It's a whole body-healthy diet. One diet to rule them all. <laughs> and what about drug side effects. I'm not talking about a little rash here or something. Prescription drugs kill more than 100,000 Americans every year. Wait a second, 106,000 Americans dead every year? That means that the sixth leading cause of death is actually doctors. The sixth leading cause of death is me. Thankfully, I can be prevented with a plant-based diet. No, seriously, compared to 15,000 American vegetarians, those that eat meat um, have about twice the odds of being on aspirin, sleeping pills, tranquilizers, antacids, painkillers, blood pressure medications, laxatives, of course, as well as insulin. So plant-based diets are great for people that don't like taking drugs, for people that don't like paying for drugs, for people that don't like risking drug side effects. Right? Want to solve the health care crisis, Mr. Trump? <laughs> I've got a suggestion. The um, most deaths, even if, let's, just to take a step back for a moment. There's only one diet that's ever been proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, a plant-based diet. So, I mean, uh, look, anytime anyone tries to sell you on some diet, do me a favor. Ask him a simple question. What do you say? Has this new diet been proven to reverse heart disease? You know, the number one reason being all my loved ones will die. The answer is no. Why would you even consider it, right? If that's all a plant based diet could do, reverse heart disease, the number, reverse the number one killer of men and women, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet to prove it otherwise? And in fact, that can also be effective in preventing, arresting, and reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and hypertension. We seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Most deaths in the United States are preventable and related to nutrition. The number one cause of death in the United States is the Global Burden of Disease Study, the largest study ever on risk factors for disease funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Number one cause of death in the United States, it's our diet. Number one cause of disability the United States for diet. Now bumping tobacco smoking to number two, cigarettes now only kill about a half a million Americans every year, whereas our diet 
kills hundreds of thousands more. So obviously, nutrition is the number one thing taught in medical school, right? <laughs> I mean, it's the number one thing your doctor talks about at every visit, right? But you say, how could there be this disconnect between the science and the practice of medicine? Well, let me end with a thought experiment to try to explain that discrepancy. Let's imagine ourselves a smoker back in the 1950s, right? Um, the, back in the 50s, the average per capita cigarette consumption is 4,000 cigarettes a year. So the, the average person walking around smoke half pack a day, on average. The media was telling you to smoke. Famous athletes agreed. Even Santa Claus wanted you to smoke. <laughs> I mean, look, you want to keep fit and, uh, and uh, stay slender, so you make sure to smoke and uh, eat lots of uh, hot dogs to stay trim and eat lots of sugar to stay slim and trim. A lot better than that apple there. I mean, sheesh, right? Um, though apples do, apples do connote goodness and freshness, reads one internal tobacco industry memo, which brings up many possibilities for a youth. They wanted to make apple flavored cigarettes for kids. Shameless. For digestion's sake, you smoke. I mean, no curative power is claimed by Philip Morris, but hey, better be safe than sorry and smoke. Blow in her face and she'll follow you anywhere. <laughs> no woman ever says no, they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. I mean, look, after all, John Wayne smoked them until he got lung cancer and died. Like, you know, back in the 50s, even the paleo folks were smoking. <laughs> and so were the doctors. Now, this is not to say there wasn't controversy within the medical field. Yes, some doctors smoked camels, you know, but others uh, preferred Lucky, so there was a little disagreement there. The leader of the U.S. Senate agreed. I mean, who wouldn't want to give their throat a vacation? Not a single case of throat irritation. How could there be when cigarettes are just as pure as the water you drink? Maybe up in Flint, Michigan. <coughs> <laughs> but don't worry. Even if you do get irritated, your doctor can always write you a prescription for cigarettes. This is the Journal of the American Medical Association, right? So when the AMA was sm saying smoking on average was good for you, when the American Medical Association was saying they weren't good, you turn back then if you just wanted the facts. What's the new data advanced by science? Well, she was too tired for fun, and then she smoked her camera. You know, Babe Ruth spoke of proof positive medical science, that is, when he still could speak, before he died of throat cancer. Now, if by some miracle, there was some smokingfacts.org website back then that could deliver the science directly, bypassing commercially corruptible institutional filters, you would have become aware of studies like this. This is an Adventist study out of California, published in 1958, showing that non-smokers had at least 90% less lung cancer than smokers. But this wasn't the first. When famed surgeon Michael DeBakey was asked why his studies back in the 30s linking lung cancer and smoking were simply ignored, he had to remind people what it was like back then. We were a smoking society. It was in the movies, it was on the airplanes, it was ever. At medical meetings where one heavy haze of smoke, smoking was, in a word, <laughs> normal. So, Back to our thought experiment, right? If you're a smoker in the 50s in the know, what do you do? 
I mean, with access to the signs, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your smoking habit, uh, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? I mean, if you wait until your doctor tells you between puffs to quit, could be, uh, you could have cancer by then. If you wait till the powers that be officially recognize it, like the Surgeon General did in the subsequent decade, you could be dead by then. It took more than 7,000 studies and the deaths of countless smokers before the first Surgeon General's report against smoking came out. You think maybe after the first 6,000 studies, you could give people a little heads up or something? Powerful industry. Right? Maybe we should have stopped smoking after the 700th study like this. As a smoker in the 50s, on one hand, you had all of society, the government, the medical profession itself telling you to smoke. And on the other hand, all you had was the science. If you're even aware of studies like this, well, let's fast forward a few decades. You know, there's a new adventure study out of California telling Americans about something else they may be putting in their mouths. And of course, it's not just one study. Put all the studies together. Those eating more plant-based, lower mortality from all causes put together. Many of our dreaded diseases, stroke, or cancer, etc., significantly lower among those eating more plant-based. So, instead of someone going along with America's smoking habits in the 50s, imagine you or someone you love, someone you know, going along with America's eating habits today. What do you do? I mean, with access to the science, you realize the best available balance of evidence suggests your eating habit, mm, not so good for you. So do you change or do you wait? If you wait until your doctor tells you between bites to change, it can be too late. In fact, even after the Surgeon General's report came out, the American medical community still dragged their feet. The AMA actually went on record refusing to endorse the Surgeon General's report. Why? Couldn't have been because they were just handed a $10 million check from the tobacco industry. Maybe. <laughs> okay, so we can see why the AMA was sucking up to the tobacco industry. But wait a second, why weren't more individual doctors speaking out? Well, there were a few ahead of their time speaking up against industries killing millions, but why not more? Maybe it's because the majority of physicians themselves smoke cigarettes. Just like the majority of physicians today continue to eat foods that are contributing to our epidemics of dietary disease. Uh, what was the AMA's rallying cry back then? Everything in moderation. Extensive scientific studies have proven smoking in moderation. Oh, that's fine. Sound familiar? The food industry uses the same tobacco industry tactics, twisting the science and misinformation. The same scientists for hire paid to downplay the risks of c cigarette smoke and toxic chemicals are the same paid for by the National Confectioners Association to downplay the risks of candy, and the same paid for by the meat industry to downplay the risks of meat. Animal products and processed foods are killing maybe 14 million people every year around the world. Those of us involved in this evidence-based nutrition revolution, we're talking about 14 million lives in the balance. Maybe plant-based diet should be considered kind of the nutritional equivalent of stopping smoking. But how long do we have to wait, though, before the CDC here in Atlanta says, don't wait for open-heart surgery uh, to start eating healthier as well? Until the system changes, we need to take personal responsibility for our own health, for our family's health. But we can't wait until society catches up to the science again, because it's a matter of life and death. You know, last year, Dr. Kim Williams became president of the American College of Cardiology. He was asked in an interview why he follows his own advice to why, that he gives to all his patients to follow a strictly plant-based diet. He said, look, I don't mind dying, Dr. Williams replied. I just don't want it to be my own fault. <laughs> Thank you so much.
thank you so much, Dr. Greger. That was amazing. We have time for just a few questions. So if my amazing Atlanta Veg Fest volunteers would come forward to help facilitate that. If you do have a question, we would like you to come down to the front. I know it's a bit hard to navigate. You can't just run like Donahue style through the hole. <laughs> All right, so it looks like folks are lining up behind a mic right here. So we had a gentleman right here in plaid. We have a gentleman in the red. Okay. Let's hear it. We're going to try to take as many of these as we can, okay? So let's see. Dr. Greger. <clears throat> yes. How about mid cow, mid chicken, mid pig, mid uh, pig disease? Oh, 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 oh. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy? Um, so, uh, yeah, mad cow disease. So, basically, humanity dodged a bullet. This new disease, which was created because we turned cows, pigs, and chickens not only to meat eaters but to cannibals as well, caused this really strange brain disease and exposed basically an entire generation of people in Great Britain and many people around the world to this new disease and we could have lost a generation. Literally tens of millions of people could die, thankfully. Very few people have actually died. It was not very um, transmission. I mean, it was transmissible, but it wasn't very infected, um, infectious um, and uh, pathological for human beings, so we just have a few hundred deaths, so that's a good thing. Um, and so, uh, you know, very kind of low on the, uh, on the list of reasons um, to eat healthy, but there's no mad cabbage to see. The head of cabbage is no, it's fine. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, but there's more people die from salmonella, kind of conventional pathogens, um, than some of these funky prions. Yes. Do we someone over here? Or, uh, no, we're back yeah. here. All right, one Hello, one Dr. Minute. Gregor. Thank Hello. you for that wonderful, wonderful talk. Um, quick question about Asians. Um, most of us, um, do have uh, vegetarian diets or healthy diets and are not obese. I'm, I'm not talking about the whole population, but uh, uh, predominantly. So where does, this is the question on diabetes. So how do you explain, is it genetic or what is the disposition towards no, no, so diabetes? We have, right, no, so we have migration studies that prove it's not genetic. So going back decades, um, so um, uh, these so-called migration studies where you take people um, and you look at their disease rates when they move from one area of the country, to, one area of the world to another area of the world. So, for example, uh, Japan had the longest life expectancy, some of the lowest breast cancer and prostate cancer rates. So the question is, was it just genetics or is it something they're eating or doing? And so you look at the disease rates of, the, of Japanese folks that moved to California, or moved to Hawaii, then moved to California, um, and what you find is they very rapidly get the disease rate. So you start eating and living like an American and you start dying like an American. Um, and vice versa, if you start eating healthy. Um, and so that was some of the earliest, um, uh, you know, uh, kind of insights as to, wait a second, it's not our genes, right? And then you could look at um, the transformation of disease rates within countries. So for example, Japan, with its long Buddhist history, ate very little meat, um, and then all of a sudden, KFC came, um, and now there's this dramatic increase um, meat eggs, dairy consumption, and, and their disease rates have skyrocketed in less than a generation. Uh, genes don't change within a generation, right? I mean, so uh, it was obviously some change in, in, in their environment. Um, and now that we have reverse, I mean, so those were all kind of, huh, that gives us some interesting kind of evidence pointing one direction, but it's not proof. What's proof is you can do an interventional style. You randomize people, you eat your regular diet, and you, we're gonna put you on a plant-based diet, we see your disease literally go away, cure your diabetes. That's how we know it's the diet. Now, Ornish did a whole bunch of things. He did meditation and exercise and plant-based diet, but subsequent researchers like Dr. Carl Wallace in the Cleveland Clinic just did diet. Let's just see, and got the same remarkable reversals just with diets. Okay, so we know it's the diet. It's not the genes, and we have control this remarkable control over our health, destiny, and longevity, the vast majority of premature death and disability is preventable from plant-based diet, not healthy lifestyle behaviors. And so the fact that we're seeing a diabetes epidemic now in China 
and in India is because now they're catching up with us. Why? Because they're catching up with our fast food consumption and our habits. Um, and unfortunately, we're going to see, um, we're, I mean, it's going to bankrupt the countries. I mean, they just can't, they could not deal with the same kind of obesity epidemic that we have. Um, and so they may be forced to start eating healthy. I mean, if they want to keep their economies going. But let's not wait until then. Um, well, you know, we can, we can, uh, we can, we don't have to wait until the system changes so we can take the personal responsibility for our family's health. Thank you. Sure. Uh, speaking of uh, Japan, uh, a lot of people talk about Japan and particularly Okinawa having a very long life expectancy in the Mediterranean diet, and they, a lot of times they attribute it to fish consumption and uh, omega-3 fatty acids. Uh, what would you say to something like that? I mean, it, do you think it's a matter of they happen to consume fish, but it's not because of the fish, it's the vegetables? Uh, or do you uh, think maybe omega-3 fatty acids are helpful, but it would have been better if they got it from flax? Like, what would you say about those studies that talk about the benefits of fish? So if you look at the, at the so-called blue zones, so there's five areas around the world, these populations that have extraordinary health and longevity. They have the most centenarians, most people live over age 100, and these are healthy, still active people. Um, and so it's like, wow, what are they doing? What are they eating? Let's look at all their diets. Um, and they're all eating generally plant-based. The one thing that they all share in common is not fish consumption, it's legume consumption. They're all centering their diets around some form of bean, whether it's uh, tofu and okinawa, or whether it's you know, brown beans in the Mediterranean, or some, there's some source of legumes in all their diets. The one thing that ties them all together, specifically being generally plant-based. But people don't understand what the Okinawan di diet actually is. So the Okinawans are the second longest living population in the world and it's 97% plant-based, whole food plant-based. So 3% includes all, uh, basically, fish and eggs in that 3%. So just a tiny, I mean, that's like what, like, you know, it's like a, what our fellow great apes, like chimpanzees eat. I mean, they, they, they you know, you know they eat some termites or something, but 97% plant-based. What, what's their diet centered on, The Sweet potatoes, actually. 70% of their calories, the vast majority of their calories, they have a sweet potato-based diet. It's purple sweet potatoes, amazing. If you can find some good Okinawan sweet potatoes, Fantastic. Okay, so they're the second longest living population. What is the longest living population on the planet Earth? It is um, the Adventist vegetarians in Loma Linda, California. Um, live longer than Okinawa Japanese. They don't eat any um, fish at all. Hey, Dr. Baker. Uh, really enjoyed your talk. Uh, this question is a little bit related to the earlier question on Indian uh, heritage. Uh, my own family, for example, the majority of them are vegetarians. There's a lot of dairy, right? I mean, there's milk, yogurt, uh, butter yeah. type stuff. Yeah. Yeah, you got it. Um, so I'm specifically looking for studies and references that compare, like a vegetarian, like, sorry, <laughs> uh, like a lacto-vegetarian diet versus a vegan diet. I'm personally vegan, but I'm, I'm looking oh, for right, right. pointers yeah, yeah, where sure. I can show them those kind sure. of studies because. Yeah, what they um, look at when they look at these yeah, studies. Yeah, no, 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 no. There's a so there's a um, the most important study actually just came out. It's actually done in India, in, in Indian population. Um, it's actually in the introduction um, to the book uh, where I talk about um, those differences. Like, it doesn't matter if you eat a little meat. Like, what's the big, you know? Um, and specifically, and so what they did is they actually um, followed people that started adding animal products back. Um, so these were people who were vegetarian being started adding, adding animal parts back and what happened to them in terms of cutting their life short and all their disease rates skyrocketed within a very short amount of time. Um, probably the, um, uh, and then I, I talked about the study done in Taiwan last year um, that looked at, for example, women eating a single serving of meat a week, like it's like a deck of cards size piece of meat a week, period, otherwise, uh, none at all, and compare that to women that ate none at all. And if you would have come to me before that and asked me, like, I wouldn't say, it's not even worth doing this study. I mean, I don't think you'd see a, I mean, it's like comparing non-smokers to someone who smokes a cigarette once in a while. You're not going to see a measurable difference. I'm not saying smoking isn't bad for you, but, I mean, it, but they did the study. Um, I was studying 4,500 people, and uh, those, for example, women, one serving a week, four times the diabetes rates. They quadruple um, their risk of diabetes, number one cause of, you know, blindness, kidney failure, amputations just that one serving of meat. So there really does seem, when we look at the Adventist two studies, not just the meat, but the people that just ate the fish and not the meat did better, people that ate no meat, excuse me, no fish, compared to the people that did eat fish did better, and the people that cut out the eggs and dairy did even significantly better. 
um, the beacons compared to the overlactivist. And it's a large study on plant-based eaters worldwide. Um, and that's the Inventus 2 study. And I've got a bunch of videos on that on the website. Thank you, Dr. Berger, for such a great talk. Um, so I posted a clip of your talk just a few minutes ago, and um, I got a Facebook comment. Isn't this the diet that killed Steve Jobs? Yeah. What would you say to that? That that is not the diet that killed Steve Jobs. Um, uh, so, so, I'm sorry. Isn't this the science that killed Steve Jobs? The um, isn't this the science? There's only one science. That in fact, that's the nice thing about science. The truth. There is just one science. Preach. And so, and so I mean so. So, I mean, one can look at the data, however one wants to look at epidemiological studies, observational studies, interventional studies, and this is the healthiest diet across the board. Now, you still get hit by a bus, I mean, there's still bad things that can happen to you. Look, even in those, even those vegans, so let's say you only have 20% the risk of diabetes or something. Look, 20%. That, compared to the American population, that's still, you can get diabetes. That's not good. I mean, the reason we put on our seatbelt it's not because someone guaranteed if we put on our seatbelt, we're never going to die in a car crash. No, why do we put the seatbelt on? Because it reduces our risk. And we're just rational. We're like, all right, it's not no guarantee. But we, and the same thing with diet. You eat healthy, and it reduces your risk of you know, this wide range of, um, uh, of uh, diseases and leading causes of death. And you know, you still got to wear your bike helmet and practice safer sex and all that all the stuff. But um, that'll take you a long way there. All right, we have got to get Dr. Greger to his book signing, so let's have one more question. Or actually, if the two women who were waiting next want to both say their question, you can just take Whoa. it from there. So, so just, concise, if you don't mind. Sure. I wanted to say thank you. Um, I'm a physician, and I really appreciate the talk. Um, I do my based uh, talks with my patients. So my question is... Oh, my God. Are you taking your patients? <laughs> well, you know, my, I'm a pulmonary people care physician, and my partner and I have actually just started a study based on your book that he stole from my office to read on IPF, because the, uh, the factor in IPF that causes IPF, we think, is telomere length. And the study that you, that you talked about in your book is, is huge for that. But the question that I have for you is, you know, like you, I probably got an hour, maybe two hours of nutrition uh, education in medical school. So I'm doing things like the plant-based nutrition course through Cornell. Right. As a physician, are there other things that you would recommend oh, to yeah. your providers? Right. Oh, fantastic question. Yeah. So there's this whole um, this whole new medical subspecialty of lifestyle medicine. It's the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. They have I am becoming a member of this. Yes, wonderful. So um, they just started um, actually certifying. So now there's a board of lifestyle medicine. So you can become board certified in lifestyle medicine. Um, and so next October, you can go to Tucson and take the test. and um, you know, we can all study up together, and, and so, but that's, there's actually an incident, and so, and you say, okay, yeah, but what kind of nutrition are they actually teaching people? Well, given that I was the one that came up with the nutrition curriculum, they're teaching pretty good nutrition. Um, so, um, yeah, no, so, I mean, I, so, I mean, it's really nice to see a, you know, a, a, an entire professional a medical organization that's really taking the kind of North Star approach, saying, look, not saying, look, it's your body, your choice. You want to smoke cigarettes? Go bungee jumping, do whatever you want. But you should just know that if you're interested in health and longevity, here's the optimal. And, you know, wherever closely you can get to that, the better. But just being, having this, not this patronizing attitude that, oh, my patients are never going to change. Look, that's the patient's. That's the patient's choice, it's not yours. By refusing to acknowledge these other options, by refusing to give the option, uh, by giving this information to our patients, we're really doing them a disservice. It's really kind of a patronizing attitude, but no more. There's a great movement now happening. So I would point fellow practitioners uh, to ACLM to become involved. All right, our final question, and then we're gonna have our book signing. Hi, my family thanks you so much for your book and all your work. Do you have any comments on food combining? Um, uh, so, yeah, yeah, you should never combine anything good with anything bad. Just stick with the good. <laughs> um, there's, there's very rare, um, so there, I mean, there is science. So I've got a bunch of videos talking about dietary diversity. 
that um, it's, it's, be it's better to have an apple and an orange than just to have two apples, even if apples are better than oranges, because each different fruit family and vegetable family has different, different health promoting compounds, and they tend to have synergistic effects, meaning uh, the sum of the parts is greater, the sum is greater than the, than the individual parts. So in general, we should eat lots of foods together. And so any time anyone comes up with these weird food combining rules, that says, oh, you shouldn't eat this, shouldn't eat this. If you're talking about healthy foods, I mean, that's just, that makes me bristle. There's no science to support any of that. Um, and I want people to eat lots of healthy foods as often as possible. Um, and so, I mean, there's, I, mean, I got some videos, there's some like really weird idiosyncratic things like if you eat black pepper with turmeric, it boosts the turmeric, you know, absorption. So that's actually something you want to have together. There's a few, but basically, healthy food is the most important thing. Stuff your face, as many fruits and vegetables as possible. Um, and whatever combination that you think that will get you to eat the most of them. How about that? Thank you so much, everybody.